Okay, so let's get going. It's uh, it's one o'clock now. So welcome to our latest eSASI Focus On. Uh, today we're dealing with protected information. I'm Matt Greaves. Uh, I'm an eSASI committee member along with Olivier Ferrant, uh, Torkel Augustin, uh, Brian McDermott, Rob Carter and Steve Hull. Who are all uh, who are all with us today? For those of you who are new to ESASI, we're uh, a regional chapter of the International Society of Air Safety Investigators. Uh, we're registered as a charitable incorporated organisation, and our object is that for the public benefit, we'll promote public safety and the saving of lives, in particular but not exclusively, by promotion of high standards in air safety investigation and the provision of education and training to air safety investigators and others operating in the aviation field. So, moving along, I mean, information and protected information is the, the lifeblood of an investigation and protecting and controlling it is vital to retaining the trust in investigation agencies. Annex 13 and Regulation 996 and National Regulations, as we'll hear, provide protections for that information. But the safety investigation is not the only process or group with an interest in that information. Uh, and equally, in a connected world, it is ever harder to control information related to an, inter to an investigation. And really, that's the landscape of where we start our presentations today. We have six speakers representing many of the stakeholders involved, including the safety investigation agencies, the legal profession, the aircraft OEMs, the regulator and the media. So let's get started. Our first speaker is, uh, and I apologise, I'm going to murder her surname, but she's promised me that that's, that's absolutely all right and almost expected. So our first speaker is Anne-Marie Schreiter from uh, the, the Dutch Safety Board. Anne-Marie, if you'd like to put your presentation up, please. Anne-Marie's a senior legal officer at the Dutch Safety Board, where she's worked for uh, 11 years. Uh, and she's going to introduce the legal framework for the protection of sensitive safety information. She's then going to talk a little bit about the, the rules in, in, as they sit in, in Dutch national law. Anne-Marie, it's all yours. Yes, I'm trying to. <laughs> yes, here it is. Can you see this? Perfect, thank you. Is it on? Oh, great. So yes, my name is Anne-Marie Schuiten. You tried nicely, but uh, I know it's difficult. So I'm the senior legal officer of the Dutch Safety Board and I will um, try to summarize the legal framework of uh, protection of uh, safety investigation information today. Uh, please indeed feel free to ask your questions. I will try to answer them um, after the presentation. Or if we're short of time, please feel free to email me or call me with whatever questions you might have regarding this uh, topic. So when we're talking about protection of safety information, what are we actually talking about? So it's accident and incident investigation records, and this could be either CVL or um, airborne image recordings or their transcripts, statements, communications between persons involved in the operation of an aircraft, medical and private information, ATC communication, opinions and analysis by investigators, information recorded in FDRs, ADRs, information exchanged by involved states or institutions, also information provided by stakeholders, and of course the draft final report in the final report. Now, why are we protecting this information uh, from the point of view of the uh, safety investigation authorities? It's because we want to safeguard accident investigation authorities' continued access to essential information. And how? Well, because I'm the lawyer, I start with the how from a legal point of view. So I will explain you the legal framework. We have ICAO Annex 13 on aircraft accident and incident investigation. And in the EU, we also have Regulation 996 on the investigation and prevention of accidents and incidents in civil aviation. But of course, there's also a lot of provisions uh, on protection in several national laws. And I will discuss a little bit about um, the national law uh, uh, in the Netherlands and um, the strict confidentiality rules we have here. 
So Annex 13 on the protection of information, you can find it in Standard 5.12. And it says that CVR and airborne uh, image recordings and their transcript, transcripts and statements taken and communication between persons involved in the operation of the aircraft, as well as medical or private information regarding persons involved, analysis and opinions of the investigation authority, and the draft final reports are not available for purposes other than accident or incident investigation unless the competent authority determines in accordance with national laws and appendix to that their disclosure or use outweighs the likely adverse domestic and international impact such action may have on that or any future investigation. Now, as you can see, I added here Appendix 2, meaning the balancing test. So Appendix 2, this is an addition made in 2016, introducing an, uh, an whole new appendix uh, dealing with the balancing test that did need to be performed by the competent authority to determine whether or not the disclosure or use requested outweighs the likely adverse domestic and international impact of such a disclosure. Um, furthermore, the information types that are mentioned here are not to be included in the final report unless absolutely necessary for the analysis. And this also has to do, of course, with the sensitive nature of these types of information. Now, there's also additional protection measures in Annex 13, not to be disclosed to the public, uh, are names of persons involved, content of CVR and airborne image recordings, and the draft final report. And then also there's a provision uh, stating that requests for records in the custody of the investigation authority should be directed to the original source of information, if available. And this can be found in standard 5.12.4. Now, let me um, talk a little bit more about the balancing test. So in appendix two, you find much more information about the balancing test, but um, be aware that the provisions are in an appendix, but they form part of the standard uh, standards and recommended practices of Annex 13. And they should be administered, those balancing tests, by the designated authority of the state where the request is, uh, is done. And in case of disclosure or use of those records for criminal, civil, administrative or disciplinary proceedings, um, the balancing test should only be um, applied if a material fact in question can absolutely be not determined without that specific record. Um, and also there is a possibility um, to do a balancing test on a certain category of records and then you can implement and incorporate those results of the balancing test in national laws. So what are factors to be taken into account when administering the balancing tests? So first of all, it's the purpose for which the record was created, uh, but also the requester's intent for the use of the record, and whether rights of a third party will be adversely affected by disclosing or using that record and whether the person or the organization to whom the record relates might consent to the disclosure or the use, and whether suitable safeguards are in place to limit further disclosure or use, and whether the record has been or can be de-identified or summarized or aggregated, and whether that record is of a particular sensitive or restrictive nature. Uh, and also whether that record can indicate gross negligence, willful misconduct or criminal intent. 
So even more additional um, recommended protection measures are in place. Um, it's about protection of the final uh, report, um, but it's, it's recommendations, so not standards, uh, so uh, much less binding. Um, and also some protective measures um, uh, about the investigation personnel in the Annex 13 and investigation personnel, um, uh, states should consider that that personnel not be compelable to give an opinion on matters of blame or liability in civil, criminal, administrative or disciplinary proceedings. Um, if you want some more information about the protection of safety information, there's also a specific uh, ICAO doc on protection of uh, information that has elaborate um, recommendations and uh, uh, yeah, instructions that you might uh, implement. So let me now go into Regulation 996 2010. Now Regulation 996 is supposed to be an implementation of Annex 13. However, uh, there are some slight uh, differences. Um, if you want to look into uh, the details more, you need to either <laughs> put my slides uh, and, and compare them uh, or get the regulations uh, side by side because there are some, um, uh, some crucial, uh, even crucial um, differences. So records not to be made available for other purposes than safety investigation statements by investigation authorities um, taken, records revealing the identity of persons who have given evidence, sensitive and personal information, and of course, including health information, material produced by the investigators, such as notes and drafts, opinions written or express, expressed during analysis, information and evidence provided by investigators from other member states or third countries if confidentiality is requested by those uh, states or countries and drafts of prelimin preliminary or final reports or interim statements and last but not least cvr image recordings transcripts atc voice recordings now, all those records should not be made available for other purposes than safety investigation. Now, there's a second paragraph of this article, and it makes a difference because it says here that the following records should not be made available for other purposes than safety investigation or other purposes aiming at improvement of aviation safety. And it's all communications between persons involved in the operation of the aircraft, written or electronic ATC recordings and transcriptions, including reports and results for eternal purposes, covering letters for the issuance of safety recommendations. And this was actually new to me when I uh, made these um, slides. I was a sort of a surprised by this, by this one. Um, and then occurrence reports filed under Directive 2003-42, uh, and I think this has been an omission because in 2014, um, the Commission implemented a new regulation on occurrence reporting, and I think um, it should be amended in the 996, and referrals should now be made to uh, the 376 and not the 2003. Um, so, yeah, that's still uh, to be done. And last but not least, FDR recording should not be used for other purposes than safety investigation and worthiness or maintenance purposes, except when the identified or disclosed under secure procedures. Now, there's an except exception on this protection in uh, Article 14, and that is if the administration of justice or the competent authority decides that disclosure outweighs the adverse domestic and international impact on that or future investigations. 
However, member states may limit the cases in which such a decision or uh, of disclosure uh, may be taken. And the communication of records to other member states for other purposes than safety investigation, airworthiness or maintenance purposes is possible, however, only if national laws permit. So these are some additional provisions um, compared to Annex 13. Now, even more provisions are in place in the 996. Article 15 deals with communication of information. And it says that there should be a professional uh, secrecy obligation uh, for all participants in the investigation. Um, there's also sort of an extra rule under the applicable legislation, meaning the applicable national legislation of the state concerned. And communication of relevant information for prevention of accidents and serious incidents to persons or entities responsible for manufacture, maintenance, operating, or tr training, um, those can be done by uh, the investigation authority. However, relevant um, factual information is also to be divulged to a YASA and civil aviation uh, authority unless that is causing a conflict of interest. Um, let me talk a little bit about communication of information to victims and relatives. Uh, now, this is also uh, slightly different from Annex 13 um, because it has a more elaborate provision. It says that the investigation authority shall be authorized to inform victims and their relatives or even their associations or make public factual observations, proceedings of the investigations, preliminary reports, conclusions, and safety recommendations, if it does not compromise the objectives of the safety investigation, and if it complies with applicable legislation on the protection of personal data. So this is also an exception uh, that has some restrictions on it. So if we take a look at the Kingdom Act Safety Board, we have taken it even a, a little step further, I might say. Um, we have provisions that say that sensitive information is not to be included in the final reports. All final reports are public. However, underlying investigation information is not public at all and it cannot even be uh, um, uh, seized or uh, it cannot be requested um, by a, so to speak, Sunshine Act or uh, other type of uh, provision. Uh, no statements are to be made in our reports or uh, about uh, guilt or liability or presumptions of guilt or liability. Um, we have a strict separation from judicial proceedings and there's a strict protection of data recordings and staff cannot be called upon to testify in judicial proceedings. And I will go into this article a little bit more in the next slide because it's really elaborate and very strict um, and complicated also. Um, and there's no obligation for us to report criminal offenses that we might come across in our investigations. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule, um, ex um, particularly in, in very severe um, uh, case of offenses. Uh, up till now, we have not been reporting any uh, offenses uh, yet. Uh, in one particular case, we were in doubt that there, there was some kind of um, possibility of a criminal offence um, uh, having taken place, but we decided not to report it. Um, and there is a confidentiality obligation for all participants in an investigation. 
Now, Article 69 of the Kingdom Safety Board um, is the most complicated article I have ever come across. And it says that not to be used as evident in any criminal, disciplinary, civil, or administrative proceeding, nor as a basis for any disciplinary administrative measure or sanction are statements, unless with explicit permission, communication recorded with a technical device, unless, and I will come later to this point, medical or private information, unless with explicit permission, data from recorders, opinions expressed following analysis of the material, documents drawn up by DSB, including the final report. And the unlesses that you see here is that the communication recorded with a technical, de technical device and data from uh, recorders uh, cannot be used in judicial proceedings unless uh, in case of a criminal investigation going on into murder, manslaughter, kidnapping or terrorism. Um, the article continues. It's much more complicated than I'm showing you now, but I think for now, for the discussion, this is enough um, about our uh, protection rules. Uh, if you want to know more, please contact me uh, later on. Um, some legal challenges. There are numerous. Uh, uh, I tried to come up with um, the most uh, evident ones. Um, for example, in our case, uh, none of our information um, is to be used in judicial proceedings. However, um, the uh, European uh, human rights uh, state that uh, person uh, are to uh, are need to be able to use anything they can to prove their innocence. So we had to um, slightly. Uh, come around again uh, about this provision uh, because otherwise it would invade on human rights uh, protection rules. So for now, our information can be used. Well, the information that is public, uh, that is to say. Uh, th so the information in the report uh, are to be uh, used if uh, to prove innocence uh, in a criminal, criminal proceeding. Um, also, we have come across some difficulties because our laws are already very um, elaborate on the protection. So is there still, uh, could there still be an obligation to administer the balancing test, if so requested by anyone? Um, yeah, and then there's also the situation where a person provides information to us, can you still ask that person to um, to be confidential about that information. Um, it's, it's, it's a complicated situation for us as well. Um, and the sharing of information with accredited representatives with very different national confidentiality rules also has been a difficulty from time to time. And yeah, as said, the use of final reports in judicial proceedings. Um, this is also complicated because, of course, our final reports are uh, publicly available. So even though our law says that they are not to be used as evidence in those proceedings, occasionally it does happen. Um, so this also poses uh, some complications uh, for us. So I want to wrap it up for now and see if there are any questions. Um, if you have an elaborate question, please feel free to contact me. I think the slides will be shared so you will have my contact uh, information. Anne-Marie, thank you so much for taking on what is a very difficult brief. I know we asked you to cover a lot of information, very complex information in a short amount of time.
Uh, our next speaker is uh, Robert Lawson QC. Robert's a partner of Clyde & Co and he's chair of its Aviation Global Practice Group. He was called to the bar in 1989 and was appointed Queen's Council in 2009 and he joined Clyde & Co in 2017. Rob's going to talk about the legal principles in play in determining what can be released and the tests as they're applied by the courts uh, and in the decided cases to date. Rob, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt, and uh, thank you to Isasi for letting me um, speak to you all today. Um, what I'm going to say represents my personal views and therefore shouldn't be attributed to any of my uh, clients. I want to begin, if I may, with um, a little preface, um, which is to refer to Brexit as every Englishman um, does at every possible occasion, just to tell you that uh, Regulation 996 of 2010 has been retained in UK law as UK law post-Brexit with only minor modifications basically to United Kingdomize it uh, and therefore um, we remain um, joined with our EU colleagues uh, in terms of legislation so far as relevant what we're going to talk out about today. I want to thank Anne-Marie for her very very useful outline then for her slides. Um, luckily, I predicted well that she would have all the slides that I wanted, so I'm going to spare you any more. As she has uh, so well summarised, Article 5.12 of Annex 13 and Article 14 of EU Regulation 996 both provide in terms that an Annex 13 investigatory body shall not disclose any of a defined set of records held by it, which in essence are those obtained by it uh, as part of or created in the course of the investigation, for a purpose permitted by law other than safety investigation, unless a designated competent authority determines that the benefit of their disclosure outweighs the likely adverse domestic and international impact that the disclosure may have on that or any future investigation. So such records as are held by the Annex 13 investigator are protected against wider disclosure or use unless this threshold is met. The determination is therefore subject to a balancing act and it's worth noting at the outset that uh, this balancing act is conducted against the premise that as Article 13 and um, Regulation 996 make clear, the sole objective of the investigation of an accident is the prevention of accidents and incidents. And it's not the purpose of this activity to apportion blame or liability. This therefore does, and in my view should, weight the balance prima facie against disclosure, because the pursuit of improving air safety by learning from past mistakes is of fundamental importance to us all. Now, of course, in saying this, I'm mindful that the final Annex 13 report itself and any interim reports along the way will become publicly available. And I would say can and should be able to answer most legitimate third party interests. And in England, unlike um, in the Netherlands, it's even admissible in civil proceedings. I, I must say, despite my best efforts to the contrary. So what we're talking about is only a potential disclosure of the underlying material held by the investigator and whether and when going behind or beyond what the reports say can be justified. So far as the UK is concerned, the relevant competent authority charged with determining if disclosure is to be made is the High Court or its equivalent in Scotland and Northern Ireland. No other judicial or any other authority can order disclosure. And this, I think, is an important qualification 
as this court is independent and impartial and can therefore approach the task objectively. I, I should say at this point that the test that is applied in the UK comes from um, EU um, 996. And although Anne-Marie helpfully referred to the balancing factors uh, within Appendix 2 uh, to Annex 13, those are not replicated within the EU regulation itself. So the test is bald in the terms that I've said, the only exception being that Article 14 does state that only data strictly necessary to the relevant purpose uh, can be disclosed. Now, there have been relatively few applications made to the court in the UK for disclosure of these protected classes of documents. So far as I am aware, there have only been four. Three of them have been successful. The fact that there have been so few is no doubt in part because such records are not necessary for most actions in respect of the victims of air accidents because of the widespread application of no fault uh, regimes contained in the Warsaw and Montreal Convention. And in cases not bother them, uh, covered by them, the presumption of liability on the basis of the principle of res ipsa locuta, the thing speaks for itself and in cases of surface damage because of strict liability by statute. But I think that it's also because the threshold is perceived as a high one. And I think that's borne out by the fact there have been so few cases that have been brought and determined by the court. Now, what they show in my view is that the answer very much depends on three things. First of all, what is being sought? Secondly, who is asking for the disclosure? And thirdly, the purpose for which it's sought. And I submit that all three things are and should be very relevant to the answer if the sole objective of accident investigation is to be upheld and served. In short, whether or not disclosure is ordered will all depend on the facts and circumstances of the particular case in issue. So let's illustrate this by reference to the four uh, cases. And I'm going to deal with them in chronological order and let's see what we can learn from them. Now, the first one is a case uh, for which there is no formal law report. I know about it because I was in it. Uh, it was in 2007. So in actual fact, under the predecessor to 996, which was Directive 9456EC as incorporated into English law. It concerned an application for disclosure of a CVR following a fatal air accident involving a light aircraft that crashed into some business premises, as well as experts reports obtained by the AAIB as part of its investigation um, from the manufacturers of the propeller and the engine concerned. That crash gave rise between on the one part, the owner of the premises and on the other part, the estate of the owner and pilot. They both thought that the CVR and experts reports would contain evidence that would prove them to be correct, which in essence rested on a dispute between them as to whether the accident was caused by pilot error or mechanical fault. So they applied jointly for disclosure on the basis that these records would assist in the fair disposal of the action between them. The AIB resisted this application as a matter of principle. The important and probably quite rare circumstances were, however, that in this case the CVR had been fitted voluntarily and the application was made on behalf of this estate of the owner of the aircraft and pilot who was using it on the fatal flight. So what he was effectively doing was asking for his property back, as well as by the other injured party, the property owner. And there was no one else who could raise a legitimate objection to the disclosure in that particular case beyond reasons of general principle as the AAIB put forward. In these circumstances, the court was prepared to order disclosure on the basis that the interests of justice in these civil proceedings between the parties 
outweighed any adverse impact that the disclosure may have on the investigation into the accident or any future investigation. The second case was brought by the person in Scotland in charge of criminal prosecutions, the Lord Advocate, and it wasn't until eight years later in 2015. It concerned an application for disclosure of a combined voice and data recorder, a CVFDR, that had been installed on a commercial helicopter that had crashed uh, with loss of life whilst returning from an offshore drilling uh, rig in the North Sea. That accident was subject to a police investigation. And in the apparent absence of any technical default, the police had asked the safety and regulatory group of the UK Civil Aviation Authority to provide an expert opinion on the performance of the flight crew during the flight in question. And the Lord Advocate considered that for this to be as accurate as possible, it required consideration of the CVFDR. The application wasn't resisted by the AIB or the helicopter operator, but it was so by the uh, co-pilot and also by the British Airline Pilots Association, BALPA, who contended that disclosure would have an adverse impact on future investigations. The court held that the police investigation was both in the public interest and the interests of justice. It noted that as used in this air, on this aircraft, the proper operation of the CVFDR did not depend on the voluntary operation of the flight crew, that the flight crew had a statutory responsibility to operate the equipment with non-compliance with that obligation attracting criminal penalty. And the judge held in these circumstances that it is inherently unlikely that flight crews who have gained the qualifications and accumulated the experience necessary to operate aircraft in which the installation of a CVFDR is mandatory will deliberately neglect their responsibilities in respect of that equipment. He also held that he didn't consider investigators would be routinely compelled to disclose CVFDRs, but that in this case, it was strictly necessary for the purposes of the police investigation. In these circumstances, disclosure was ordered because it would have, so the judge said, the benefit of furthering the public interests and the interests of justice in the police investigation and would not have an adverse impact on accident investigation. Although I think it's worth adding that the disclosure was made subject to strict conditions limiting its use and the person to whom it could be disclosed. The third case involved a criminal prosecution as well of a pilot who crashed on a public road when performing a stunt at an air show at Shoreham Airport, killing 11 people on the ground. No doubt many of you will be aware of this crash. The application was made by the police, first of all, for statements made by the pilot to the AIB, secondly, to film footage from a GoPro camera that the pilot had voluntarily installed in the cockpit and was filming during the accident. And thirdly, for material related to experiments conducted and tests done as part of the investigation itself. This application was resisted by the AAIB to the extent that it contended that the disclosure of this information would have a significant and adverse impact on future accident investigations, and also by BALPA for uh, similar reasons. The court refused the application uh, in relation to the statements made, holding that it was almost inconceivable that statements made to the AAIB could be properly the subject of an order for disclosure when the appropriate balancing act is done by this court, because there would be a serious and obvious chilling effect which would tend to deter people from answering questions by the AAIB with a candor which is necessary when accidents of this sort have to be investigated. And also because it would be unfair given the AAIB's statutory powers to compel answers to its questions. 
But the court did allow the application in relation to the film footage on the basis that the camera concerned was not only installed on a voluntary basis, but for leisure and commercial reasons. And with the intention that the film footage obtained during the air show would then be used as part of a broadcast. And so the judge thought such voluntary installations would not be deterred. He also considered that the film footage had significant potential value for the police investigation in this case, since it was a contemporaneous record of what happened during the flight itself. However, the court went on to refuse the application for the test and experiment material because the judge thought they were matters the police could investigate for themselves. They would be covered in the final report and also for reasons that were kept confidential having regard to the impending criminal case. The fourth and last case arose out of that same accident and indeed the criminal trial of the pilot that then followed. In the course of that trial, the GoPro film uh, was played in open court as part of the evidence put to the jury. The BBC and the Press Association then applied for disclosure of the film footage so that they could use it as part of their broadcast coverage of the trial. This was resisted by the prosecutor as well as by the AAIB and BALPA. In this case, the judge accepted that there is a strong presumption in the criminal courts in favor of open justice and that release of the material produced in evidence to the media for the purpose of fair reporting is an essential part of that. However, he also accepted that it's important to the maintenance of effective air safety investigation that pilots understand that material they supply to the AAIB will remain with the AAIB. And he concluded that he wasn't satisfied that the benefit of disclosure to the media would outweigh the potential adverse impact on future investigations. Not least when, he said, footage of the crash was readily available from other sources. So drawing these together, we have so far seen a measured and perhaps conservative approach in the UK as to how this balance is to be made. What is apparent is that the court takes into consideration, first of all, what is being sought, considering the basis on which it was created and the extent to which its disclosure would impact on records of a like kind being created in the future, with the position of contemporaneous records created pursuant to a legal obligation, perhaps being more amenable to disclosure than ones of a voluntary nature or created in the investigation itself. And then secondly, uh, consideration of who is asking for the disclosure and for what purpose. Consideration being given to the legitimacy of the interest in obtaining it, with bodies discharging a public duty looked on more favorably than ones acting in furtherance of their own interest, except perhaps if, as the first uh, case indicates, the person concerns are the owners or the subject of the records concerned and they want them for their own purposes and not for wider dissemination. And in my view, this is the correct approach. It can and should be assumed that disclosure of these protected classes of record will be likely to have an adverse domestic and international impact on future accident investigations, especially if it's done with any regularity or at least given the importance of learning from and preventing future accidents, erring on the side of caution should lead us to that presumption. It should therefore only be in exceptional circumstances that disclosure should be given and the burden should be on the person asking for it to justify why that exception should be made. Thank you. Our next speakers are, uh, are Bernd Oswald and Michel Martin from uh, Airbus Helicopters. Uh, Bernd's the head of accident investigation at Airbus Helicopters, where he's worked for more than 12 years. And Michel Martin is uh, a senior helicopter accident investigator, uh, and he's worked at Airbus Helicopters for more than 30 years, presumably starting when he was about six. Um, 
Burns and Michelle will present uh, Airbus's policy on the protection of sensitive safety information and talk about the need to communicate key safety information to their customers. Burnt, Michelle, it's over to you. Thank you. Yeah, hello to everyone. So thanks for the invitation, Matt and Olivier. That was quite uh, a pleasure to do that. So I tried to share the screen at first and I hope it will work. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, this, this presentation is about uh, the protected information and data and as well a little bit about the dilemma we uh, from Airbus helicopters as OEMs are in because of course there is some adverse interest uh, if you talk about uh, the investigation and the purpose of the investigation and as well uh, the interest of operators or customers who are flying for example the same machine the same type of helicopter so uh, they have of course um, something they they want to know and uh, this is sometimes really uh, putting us into a conflict and we will just explain a little bit about it so i'll try to swap the slides and this is the first one um, as uh, Anne marie and um, as well robert already explained um, the full full purpose of um, the accident investigation is always kept to be kept in mind, and this is to prevent the reoccurrence of accidents. So this is as well something which is on our first uh, rank in our tables. Uh, so we have to to respect that, and there is as well a big target, very much in line with the uh, European Rotocraft Safety Roadmap. So this is really about the Rotocraft in that uh, respect. Uh, which is to reduce uh, or to improve safety by 50% uh, within 10 years and starting in 2018. But uh, we, we thought from ourselves it's a little bit too um, non-specific. So we uh, put into our targets that we want to reduce uh, the accident rate by 50%. So really the accident rate. And there are some other elements which are to be taken into account. So especially uh, by 2028, we don't want to see any more um, an accident where we have a technical contribution from the OEM side, uh, which means that root cause or uh, technical factors should be uh, no more seen uh, on our types. And the second one is as well that for, in, for survivable accidents, there should be no injury or no death coming from that. Uh, but this is technical, but it's not everything. Most of our accidents, and we are... I think for, for the Airbus fleet, we are more than 80% uh, in an operational root cause sector. And for that, we have to do as well a lot of things. If we want to reduce the rate by 50%, then we have to work as well on the operational factors. And this is very much uh, where our need comes from um, to go with a data-driven approach for improvements, um, which we need uh, to get or to uh, receive. Uh, that means data driven, that means data reception from the accident investigations, from the data uh, being produced by the aircraft, uh, by cameras, for example, Vision 1000 camera is one element we have introduced into the market, uh, which is used widely both for accident investigation, but as well for training. And this is what we, we want to end up with. It's more anticipation and training uh, than lessons learned from accidents, but we will see where, uh, how we can come to that. So for uh, the second part, um, of course, ICAO NX13 and the chapter 512 is well known to us. And uh, for, for the sequence of activity on how an accident investigation will be started, first thing is always that uh, we as an OEM and the investigators with the OEM will be participating only if the accident investigation um, authority will be appointing us as technical advisors. That means in our case, it's BA and BFU, um, where the accredited representative will uh, notify ourselves as technical advisors. So only if this is the case, we will participate. Um, then, of course, uh, once this is done, we will fully support uh, all the accident investigation authorities, um, whoever is participating. So that could be several in cases, of course. And um, our goal is to provide everything what we are capable of providing. So all the, our expertise, all uh, the, the technology, all the tools, simulations, whatever we can uh, do and con uh, can contribute to an investigation will be provided. 
So as well, uh, with regards going back to the uh, protection of evidence and um, protecting as well the affected persons or stakeholders uh, within an accident investigation. This is clearly our goal. And we have as well um, kind of uh, code of conduct uh, for our investigators, which, which will be uh, strictly adhered to. It's uh, even in collaboration existing or in, in preparation with Airbus Commercial. So the whole Airbus group fixed wing or helicopters will apply uh, in terms of accident investigations to these code of conduct, which uh, encompasses a set of values uh, on how to behave, uh, what to do with data and so on. So that's exactly what we are talking about, what to do with data. We want to protect data, of course, and we have some measures in place, but as well, and now the dilemma is, is starting, uh, we have to fulfill our obligations from ICAO Annex 8, which is the continued evidence part for our aircraft. So, uh, of course, we will get a lot of uh, questions from customers who are operating the si same type of aircraft if a crash happened. Uh, and we need to uh, protect our fleet with uh, exactly protective measures or in a later state than uh, with corrective measures. So for that, uh, we have to communicate um, in a kind of uh, way where uh, maybe the information not, not yet is really uh, released to the public. Uh, we are in the midst or at the beginning of an investigation, and this is exactly where we have to weigh and balance about uh, what can we say, what can we state. Um, and uh, our most important thing is really triggering immediate safety actions, um, which should protect uh, the, the lives, uh, but as well, um, which should protect the evidence in the safety investigation. So it's really all about protecting people and uh, preventing damage. And now, Michel, it's your turn. Uh, yes. <clears throat> what, what is important also to note is that the uh, helicopter world is a, a small, very well-connected world. I will take, for example, the offshore world. And when an accident occurs, the accident occurrence is widely spread through the network and shared between the different operator and user. As the manufacturer, Airbus helicopter receive very quickly some question about the accident. For example, if there is some available circumstances, if there is some suspected origin. And of course, all these questions are mainly driven by the, the, the sub safety objective. And mainly, is there any technical issue suspected within this accident that need to be addressed immediately? For this reason, Airbus helicopter considers that his duty is to inform his customer through a line to take that first, they, they are informed about the accident. If an official investigation is open, that they are participating to this investigation if it is the case, and so that they will be able to react if necessary and possibly the first factual information if relevant. It is for us very important that the, our customer are the warranty that we will be able to be in the loop in the accident to be able to react very quickly. So it's as well about I trust give, building. Yeah, yeah I, will give the, 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 I will give back the floor to Bern. Okay. Um, so, if, uh, just recalling what uh, was on our first slide with our purpose to prevent uh, accidents or uh, the same type of ac accidents to reoccur. It is well about uh, conveying messages to, to our operators. So if we are in the domain of uh, more than 80% of operational root causes, we want of course to uh, do a kind of learning exercise together with the, with the operators. So this is only being done once there is a public uh, report available and the accident investigation has been closed. But uh, in order to diminish the uh, operational uh, or amount of, of operational root causes, uh, we see that this one brick uh, in order to bring down the figure or the rates. So next one, sorry for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, this, this slide is about how we do that in Airbus helicopters. How do we uh, protect confidential data? How do we protect data coming from, uh, for example, I mentioned the Vision 1000 image recorder camera, which is installed in the cockpit, um, or the, the CVFDR data. 
So once we are involved in an invest investigation, um, the, the policy of Airbus is that uh, all what is related to uh, accidents is classified Airbus red. This means that it's confidential data and it needs to be protected. There is a rule in Airbus that uh, this is going to be protected uh, and cannot be accessed by anyone in the company. Uh, that means if you are sending information via email, uh, this email needs to be encrypted. Uh, of course, as well, the storage of such information uh, can only be done in a protected network uh, with very limited access to uh, only a few people. So that means only of those who are really involved in an investigation will be granted access for, for this data. And um, of course, uh, there is protective means like encryption keys to make sure that uh, no one else who should not um, uh, access the, these information can do that. So this is uh, the ways how we work uh, in Airbus to protect this. And um, as I said, from a lessons learned approach to a safety enhancement by anticipation, uh, this will be only possible uh, with the help of all available data and the uh, utilization of the latest technological methods as well. So, and these technology uh, bricks are only possible if we can use the data. Uh, that means this is the data-driven approach I was talking about. And um, this is as well because, uh, or why, Airbus Helicopters relies on a continuous and complete exchange and a collaboration with all the investigation authorities. Um, so one of the, the means or a few of them uh, which we are uh, thinking of uh, so to explain why the data-driven approach is so important is, for example, uh, 3D animation. That means it's uh, visualization of flight paths, uh, for example, on the basis of CVFDR data, on the basis of witness statements, um, then there is digital model modeling. That means uh, we can uh, replay the flight path as well with other means from, from CVFDR, um, simulate things uh, by uh, not only in the simulators of the aircraft, but as well uh, engineering simulations from, uh, let's say, blade aerodynamic behavior. Um, then, um, of course, human factors analysis is one brick it's a very important one uh, going back to the uh, operational root causes uh, domain. Uh, there is a lot of decisions uh, from pilots or crew uh, which need to be understood and uh, this only can be done with uh, human factors analysis. For that, all, uh, all these uh, things require data and this is uh, why we are uh, trying to exchange as much as possible if only for the purpose of investigation with the authorities in order to uh, help them for uh, providing the means what we can do with, with our technological bricks. So our experience uh, in AH, AHD is that we were never having a conflict uh, or a violation of regulations and there were no disputes as far as I know at least. And I hope you agree and you might um, revert to, to us back in, in the chat or uh, with the emails later on if you think there is a problematic situation with Airbus helicopters in supporting the accident investigations. Um, as well, uh, with regards to the recorder policy we have, um, so that's not only the Vision 1000 camera, but as well, uh, let's say, light data recorders or cockpit voice flight data recorders, which should as well serve uh, both the authorities and uh, the industry in investigations. And I hope you agree as well, uh, but let us know so that we, we can learn and maybe can improve. And that's it basically for our part. And I would thank you very much and hand over to Matt again. Thank you so much, Bernd and Michelle. Thank you. That's, uh, that's greatly appreciated. Our next speaker is, uh, is Alessandro Cometa. Alessandro is a senior safety investigation officer at EASA, where he worked for six years. And prior to that, uh, he was an accident investigator with ANSV uh, in Italy. Alessandro is going to talk about how EASA managed safety sensitive, in sensitive safety information coming from accident investigation. And he'll also touch on the continuing airworthiness processes which are based on that safety information coming from investigations. Alessandro, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Matt, for your kind introduction. And also, thank you very much for the invitation to this is as a focus on. Uh, let me share my uh, my slides. 
You also win the prize for most Christmassy background, Alessandro. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> I was in office this morning, but then I decided to move uh, here for that reason. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. So, okay. Okay. So let me uh, go straight to the point uh, since I believe that we are a bit uh, behind of schedule. Um, yes, IASA, uh, of course, is not a safety investigation authority, it's a certifying uh, certification authority, and, but we have an office, as you can see, it's a safety investigation section uh, dealing with the Annex 13 uh, and the, um, the Revolution 996 2010 uh, requirements, so with reference to the investigation follow up. Dealing with several recommendations, of course, uh, as you probably know, that uh, as you can imagine also, so IASA is one of the uh, main uh, addressee for, for several recommendations, I would say. And also in, in our office is, uh, is managed the CSR, uh, CSR program, so the Confidential Safety Reporting System. Even the name, you know, confidential is something that already uh, can, can, can go to the protection, uh, protected information. Um, with reference to the objectives uh, that we have in my office, of course, uh, once there is an, uh, an open investigation to support the investigator in charge, to support the accredited representative in case the investigation is not led by a European uh, safety investigation authority. Uh, as uh, said already by Anne-Marie, we, uh, we have the possibility also to, to have a technical advisor uh, as per the 996, uh, the regulation 996-2010. And so on the other side, from one side, we support the investigation. On the other side, you know, we get information from, from this investigation. Uh, one of the objectives is, of course, to get, uh, to be aware about uh, possible potential safety deficiencies and to disseminate this kind of information internally, I mean, within IASA, uh, to establish possible potential, uh, potential corrective actions. Uh, I will go fast on this slide because uh, my colleagues uh, already, you know, elaborate on this uh, on this side. Just to, to say that uh, thanks to the Article Eight, we are also we have also rights to uh, to, to to participate. I mean, uh, physically, even during the, uh, during uh, off scene investigative in investigation activities, like for example analysis, lab analysis, but even uh, FDR readout. I would like to give you the flavor, the, the, the feeling of uh, the amount of data that we receive uh, within IAS. In this case, I'm, I'm talking about draft reports. So we are talking about protected information because the draft reports is not published yet. Um, of, of course, the trend that you are, uh, you are watching on, on the slide, so a positive trend from 2018 to 2021 uh, does not uh, match you know the number of accidents or events let me say it's just a trend which has a uh, different uh, um, uh, explanations but um, is not the, the, the this one that the, the thought to, to talk about that just for you to to have a look that we we used to receive more than 300 uh, 400 um, uh, draft reports per uh, per year and uh, we, of course, we are uh, we are asked to comment on that as per the 996 uh, um, uh, procedures. And uh, as you can see, the red the red part of the of the graph is the ones uh, are the ones on which we have provided some some comments. So talking about protected information, of course, when the investig investigation start, we receive the, the notification. Already the notification is something that uh, can, could contain could, uh, protected information. Uh, which way we manage it? So first of all, the, 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 the notification is received by our office, so by the section uh, dealing with the safety investigation. Uh, as I said by Matt, uh, I, my background is within an, an, an accident investigation board, so, so also, also uh, my colleagues uh, have this kind of background just for that reason, in order also to be able to, to manage uh, uh, this kind of information properly. Uh, but this information is shared with at least uh, with, uh, with the, the, the PCM, the project certification manager. Uh, of course, we have one project, project certification manager for that specific aircraft type, uh, and of course, we uh, manage to uh, to advise, let me say, to coordinate uh, with uh, this PCM, this colleague, which way this kind of information uh, need, needs to be uh, uh, managed. 
Then there is, of course, the case of the draft report. In this case, uh, our section, again, which appointed for sure on this, uh, on this event, a technical advisor, we have the, the role to coordinate all the process. But in this case, the, the, the draft report will be uh, circulated internally uh, to a number of experts. OK, I put there a limited number, of course. Uh, but, uh, but we are talking about uh, uh, a number of persons. So uh, there is the PCM again. But uh, if we are talking about a major uh, event, even the management, uh, and then there is a possibility or, or even a need to involve uh, people from the flight test uh, panel, for example, or other other colleagues. So we are not talking about one or two persons, but more than that. Yes, we can put there uh, some uh, legal notice, and we do that. In fact, these are from, from uh, our uh, internal uh, working instruction. Uh, so anytime that we have a draft, we have this kind of, uh, of uh, advices uh, uh, to, to our colleagues in order to be sure that they remember about our, uh, our internal policy. But I would like also to mention another case, the case when the safety investigation authorities is asking us for data. So it's not, uh, um, it, it is, is, I would say, quite a common situation during the investigation, while, uh, for, for example, the investigation is highlighting um, a technical problem to ask us about you know, our assessment, for example, on, uh, on that specific uh, failure scenario, or even something with reference to the initial certification. So in that case, uh, mainly on the initial certification, we have some documents which are not publicly available. They are documents you know, related to exchange of documents between IASA and the PC holder. So for example, the manufacturer. And in that case, uh, we have a process, uh, I, I would say a procedure in, uh, within IASA in order to disclose these, these documents only for safety investigation purposes. There will be a document signed by the ED, executive director, stating that that information could be used only for that specific purposes. I would like to drive your attention on one part of the sentence that we, I, I was talking about before with reference to the draft reports um, distribution within IASA. So IASA internal only, but what does, what, what does it mean? So internal, as I said, uh, in terms of stakeholders, we, we have uh, the PCMs uh, or uh, some colleagues uh, expert on a specific field, again, the flight test panel, for example, but not only. Or in case of uh, major events, of course, the, the, the director, head of departments, etc. But also external, yes, because uh, there are possibilities where the, the PCM, so the project certification manager, working for IASA, so with an IASA hat, is a sitting outside the IASA organization. So uh, there are cases, uh, and I can mention uh, many of them, uh, mainly uh, in the general aviation, uh, where the PCM is from the, one of the European uh, uh, Union National Aviation Authorities. So in this case, of course, the notification will, will, uh, will go outside the ASA, let me say, to a person which is, who is working, yes, for the ASA, but is, uh, is uh, uh, within another organization. So in this case, of course, uh, uh, measures to uh, to limit uh, these critical points uh, on uh, on the protection of data, and also as said by Michelle, we have the, the need also to uh, Michelle and, and and the other colleague from from uh, Airbus helicopter, we have the need to deal with the, the manufacturer to the PC holder. So uh, at the end, uh, all these processes uh, are led, coordinated, let me say, uh, within the ASA by my office and by the ASA technical advisor, which is you know, one of the uh, action that we put in, pay, in place to mitigate the possibility to, uh, to have a disclosure of information. I want to get back to the uh, need that we have to have a, uh, to, to be involved in the safety investigation. Uh, of course, there are continuous awareness um, obligations. Yes, I, I put here some general reference with the Annex 8, but I, I want also to uh, highlight that uh, in the Annex 8, uh, 
uh, there is a specific mention uh, to the state safety program, to the SMS, but also to the accident investigation uh, process as a source of data to uh, be fed uh, within the, 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 the continuing airworthiness processes. Then, of course, this is something that uh, all of us is, is, uh, is aware. So the, the, the provision also from the Annex 13 to, to share this information as soon as possible uh, with the, 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 the state of manufacturer uh, in order to have the possibility to react and on the, on the airworthiness point of view nothing new and then some specific provision i put here at the end uh, for, for us i would say at the base at the base of our uh, our job because the part 21 is uh, is uh, for for the certifi initial certification and continuing certification uh, so i will give you some example with the next slides of course uh, some provision to man to manage uh, the possibility to have failures malfunction and defects uh, how to manage them and uh, the possibility to issue airworthiness directive okay uh, let me put on the on the screen uh, you know a sadly famous uh, uh, example uh, we had uh, unfortunately two events on the on the max two major events on the max one in indonesia another one on, in ethiopia and this is one one of the examples where the action from yasa side was quite prompt let me say after the second event on the first event we were not involved we had no rights to be involved because the, the investigation was led by uh, indonesia uh, and we had no uh, European safety investigation authorities uh, um, participating to the investigation, but thanks to the very good relationship that we, we have with Indonesia due to some uh, other international programs in place, we had uh, many information coming from Indonesia on that. But during the second event in Ethiopia, uh, we received an invitation directly from the Ethiopian government to, to join the investigation team just a few days after the event. So uh, as a technical advisor uh, traveled to Ethiopia, it was myself in that case. So the event was on the 10th of March. I was there, let me say, one week uh, after. And on the 25th of March, uh, we issued um, an AD uh, grounding the fleet. <clears throat> of course, the main uh, source of, in of information was the unexpected investigation. Uh, we had no other possibility to get information on these two events, and not only the Ethiopian one, because we already also got some information from Indonesia. I want, uh, would like also to highlight that during the investigation, there was also a parallel process in, uh, in Yasa, uh, assessing uh, again the certification of this aircraft. So there were design changes. There were also new uh, provision for uh, uh, training for, for, for the crew. And we issued another AD on 2021 in February. And again, before the, the final report was, was ready, just to say that also in this case, all the action put in place from YASA on this, on this aircraft type uh, um, were taken while the final report was not there, was not still there. Other two examples, this is coming directly from the, the, the reference, the regulation reference that, that, that I put on the other slide. For example, this is an emergency awarding directive, so uh, from the part 21. Uh, of course, you can find all of them uh, in the web, on the website, they are public. I just put some uh, black box because uh, uh, you know there are uh, airworthiness directive uh, more or less on all the, the aircraft types because uh, during the continuing airworthiness of course uh, uh, not only for the accident but also for the operational life of the aircraft you will discover something for which you have to mandate uh, something technical uh, so i just put an, a black box not to say in this for this aircraft we, we issued an ad but we issued ad for more or less all the aircraft uh, certified it's quite a normal uh, uh, situation but also uh, we issue the safety information bulletin, which is not mandatory and is sometimes is more on the operational side. As you can see in this case is, uh, is to advise the, the crew uh, about uh, possible uh, behavior of the aircraft and how to react. So, uh, so far we have talked about the uh, design improvement from the technical point of view. 
but I would say that the, 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 the information coming from an accident investigation are not feeding only the technical side, are feeding also the operational side. As you probably know, in IASA, we have an office dealing with the authorization to the third country uh, operator that would like to, to fly uh, to Europe or over, even over Europe. Uh, there is a, regula a European regulation for that. And uh, before to uh, uh, release an authorization to those operators, of course, there is an assessment on the operator itself. And in case there are accidents uh, which can fall uh, into the operational side, of course, there, there, there will be also a, a, a reassessment, let me say, or just, you know, uh, uh, an eye on this on this kind of uh, operator in order to understand if the uh, there is an action by the third country operators office to 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 be carried out uh, on this operator operator. Also, these are just examples. Also, we have a, uh, a standardization activity with reference to all the other European Union uh, national aviation authorities in order to understand which which way uh, I would say at what level they apply. Uh, the European regulation. And also in this case, say if there is a, 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 an item to be uh, assessed, further assessed, uh, we, can, uh, we can organize a dedicated audit. audit. And when I say we, I mean IASA, but not my office. And for uh, uh, organization approved directly by IASA, for example, uh, I put here just again some example of part 145 for the, for the maintenance. Uh, if they are based outside Europe, they are approved directly by IASA. If not, they are approved by the National Aviation Authority in Europe. So in, the, in those cases also, in case there is, you know, uh, there are items, uh, coming from an investigation with a specific organization, we uh, organize dedicated audit. Again, this one is not something that uh, fall in the topic of the uh, blame or liability. It's something related to the safety. So it's, it's, it's an audit uh, checking, uh, you know, what, what is uh, the, uh, the critical, what are the critical items coming from uh, an investigation. So conclusions, uh, again, Protect the information for us, and I believe that is clear also for the requirement, uh, does not mean keeping a, a secret. So there is a need to use them, but uh, I put here in clear for safety purposes. So I, I agree 100% with the colleagues um, who made the presentation in the beginning, and Marie. Uh, as, as first uh, presenter, because uh, of course, when the, the information is used outside the safety purpose, it is not something that match, you know, the philosophy of the, of the Annex 13 and the uh, Regulation 996, even for the participation of IASA uh, within an investigation. Uh, there is a statement in the rules, uh, if no conflict of interest is in, in, uh, in place. Then uh, let me smile a bit on that, because, you know, once uh, we certified an, a, a, an aircraft, uh, to identify a conflict of interest is, is a such, uh, you know, a wide uh, sentence that, <laughs> that we could not participate to any uh, investigation. But, uh, okay, the, the, the concept is there. We apply, of course, internal policies to limit uh, the distribution of protected information, to advise and guide uh, our, our colleagues and the stakeholders on how to manage this kind of protected information, the information coming from an, an extreme investigation. Uh, and uh, also we apply this internal policy for the information that we release to the safety investigation authorities. And again, you know, the, the information coming from a safety investigation are not used only because I believe that this is the main, uh, the main, uh, you know, stream of, uh, of uh, processes that we have within IASA. They, they are not only used for uh, certification and design uh, topics, but they are also used for, uh, um, for, for other uh, processes, as I showed you in the previous, uh, in the previous slides. So. That's all. I hope that uh, I made it short enough, uh, Matt. And if there are questions, of course, uh, I let Thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you so yes. much, Alessandro. Really appreciate it. Okay.
Uh, next speaker is Tim Heffer. Tim is the Global Aerospace Industry Editor at Reuters, where he's worked for nearly 10 years. And Tim will present the point of view of journalists who seek to inform the public with accurate information in a timely manner. Tim will also discuss the issue of speculation in social media. Tim, if you're there, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And thank you, Sassi, uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm afraid I've worked at Reuters even longer than that, as you can perhaps tell from my grey hair, but, um, but no, no problem at all. Um, I'm, uh, as you said, I'm a very much an aviation specialist these days. I've spent about half my career covering aviation um, and uh, very passionate about doing so and benefit enormously from the expertise and the support of many people here and, and elsewhere. I should say I'm not an air accident investigator and I'm not a lawyer, um, so I won't attempt to um, tackle some of the sort of theoretical points which have been um, uh, covered um, with great distinction earlier. Um, I'm just going to talk about the practice of journalism as I see it and, and share a few experiences and hope that it's helpful. Um, as I said, I'm a very much a specialist aviation journalist. We're a very rare breed these days. There used to be an aviation correspondent with every newspaper when I grew up in Britain. Um, that's very much not the case. Um, many, uh, you, many just have a transportation correspondent, if that. Um, there are other types of journalists covering accidents, sort of general journalists increasingly come in to fill the gap. Uh, you've got the new media, which I think can be really excellent um, uh, on the internet. And of course you have social media and I wouldn't claim to be able to understand the swirl and fog that comes out of social media, uh, except to say that it can also contribute a great deal in the, in the middle of that speculation. There are a lot of people out there with a lot of brain power who are, uh, coming in to join the discussion on aircraft accidents, analyzing the data that's available and so forth. Uh, so there's, um, you know, journalism right across the, the, the spectrum. I'm reminded of something that um, Mr. Aslanya, the former head of the BEA, I believe used to say that um, uh, an air accident is a spectacular event of which the explanation is not spectacular. Um, and, and comes in much later after your extremely thorough investigation, those small uh, separate pieces of the jigsaw coming together gradually over time. And journalism sort of runs across that spectrum, but is obviously very much focused on the immediate event, the spectacular side. Those of us who cover aviation permanently I would like to think we follow the course through to the end and perhaps try to carry some of the lessons from what we've learned from your reports and your work through to the next accident so that when something uh, does happen, we're able to say pretty quickly, um, you know, this, this or that may be known today, but it's just one element. It's part of a picture that is inevitably going to be complicated. And we try to explain right from the beginning um, how multiple factors, as you of course know better than me, come together to explain uh, an air accident and also how the purpose of, how the investigation will be organized, who will do the investigation, who will be accredited, all of this sort of information is, is valuable to the public, I think, at the beginning. And we always stress, at least in our stories in Reuters, we try to stress that uh, what the role of uh, Annex 13 investigation is. It is not to cast blame. And I'm very glad that you mentioned the anniversary of the Chicago Convention. Um, I think all of us who cover aviation have an, an, an enormous respect for the convention, for the work that's done by everybody here, and for Annex 13 in particular, which I think is a, a masterpiece of international cooperation. Uh, happens at a sort of out of sight, but is, is nonetheless, nonetheless remarkable for that. Um, so when I think about protected information, I, 
I, I think about our respective roles. Um, and I think all of us are sort of seekers of truth in one way or another, and ultimately are working for the public, whether you're working for them, hopefully a large part of the media, most of the media I think are pretty serious, it might not always look that way in the tumult of an accident, but I, I think hopefully most journalists are fairly serious about trying to seek the truth. And I know that's, um, that's what, uh, accident investigators are, of course, trying to do with a view to preventing further accidents. There are some important differences. Um, firstly, the timeline. You, you know, as I said earlier, um, you know, journalism is the first draft of history. It's not the final report of history. There is no final news story. Um, I, it responds to a different requirement. Both are valid. But I think there is enormous public interest, overwhelming public interest these days, augmented by social media and so forth, 24 hour television. Uh, anytime there is a tragic accident. And on those occasions, and also in other matters, you know, the, the way in which information is shared between to the public is in a is in a is a more fragmented process. It, it, the, the truth comes to light in a more sort of pixelated way. It doesn't all come, people were not prepared to wait for a year to, 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 for any understanding. And we try to build up the picture piece by piece, but surrounded by context where we can. I think uh, any fact in isolation has the power to be uh, misleading and speculative, but when adjusted to context or your awareness or knowledge of previous accidents, it can be much more useful. So that's what we try to do. And there's a balance there between the priority of you know, the public has of immediate understanding and awareness, which we're trying to serve. But at the same time, the, the, the downside of that is there's inevitably a sort of incompleteness and fallibility about journalism. And we try to uh, correct that as much as possible by using our contacts, our knowledge, and the information that you are able to provide us to sort of put context ar around the facts that are coming out. The other thing is I think that our field of vision um, is slightly different. Um, I, uh, obviously, the role of an Annex 13 investigation is to prevent future accidents. And that encompasses an awful lot of material. Um, the, the, the circumstances of the accident, the cause of the accident, they are the most important factors. They, they, they dominate your work and they dominate our coverage. But sometimes we go beyond that. Sometimes the conduct of the investigation might be part of the story um, in cases where one might imagine there could be political pressure perhaps on the investigation. There might be competition for access to evidence from uh, judicial investigation. Uh, you might have a breakdown in the discipline of the investigation in which parties obliquely, more or less obliquely attack each other during the investigation. And just in the time, almost 20 years that I've been covering aviation, I've seen more than one example of all of those, which I think were legitimate for us to to look into, but which obviously aren't in the scope of the investigation itself and are not really what Annex 13 was intended for. So there's, there's huge overlapping um, field of interest, but not entirely, over, not entirely overlapping. And I think uh, flowing from that, um, it follows that our mission as journalists, I think, is to inform the public, to try to serve the public interest, which is extremely difficult to define. I won't attempt to do so because I'm not a media regulation expert or, or lawyer, but I, I think most of us by experience and judgment have a reasonable idea of what the public interest is, but we shouldn't abuse that to justify publishing whatever we want. We have to push ourselves to justify what we're doing. Um, so uh, that's the sort of context. Nonetheless, there are enormous similarities in our work. Um, uh, firstly, I hear the, the word validation a lot. Um, that's certainly something that's very important for us. 
um, certainly for a company like Reuters. I work for Reuters, which I think is uh, hopefully uh, known to most of you. Um, we do have a very strong code of contact and also what we call our trust principles, which um, commit us to being fair and uh, acting with integrity. And we're not working for anybody. Uh, there are powerful interests in aviation um, and we're not on anyone's side. So that's hopefully where our uh, legitimacy comes from. But nonetheless, we have to validate, we have to justify what we publish. And we do that in a number of ways, um, sort of uh, quantitative and qualitative ways, if you like. Uh, firstly, if we are publishing information, unless it's simply disseminating something that's announced officially, um, a lot of information comes from people who are speaking to us, just as they're speaking to you as investigators, on the understanding that they won't be identified. Um, and we have to protect them, but it's better if there are more than one of them. And that's a big part of the validation. Can we try to find people uh, to, to, to corroborate what, what somebody has said before we publish it? So the number of sources is um, important. Um, it might happen exceptionally that we write a story with one source, um, the bar for that would have to be pretty high in my organization, and I think most serious news organizations. We can do it, but there would be a very strong internal challenge. Uh, you would have to justify that to editors. Um, uh, that person would, you, there would be questions asked about, you know, how do they know, uh, and, and so forth. Um, but that's more the exception. Um, and then there's a sort of a, a qualitative check. I, I just touched on that, but you know, in general, are these sources reliable? Are they in a position to know? Uh, and also, importantly, why are they telling us? You know, um, one might think that nobody in their right mind would talk to a journalist, and we, you know, sometimes we we have to ask ourselves why people are talking to us. Most people, I think, do so because they have a genuine, sincere desire to share information and their understanding and what can often be a very traumatic period after a crash. And people are genuinely uh, want to help. But some people do uh, talk to journalists because they want to spin the story one way or the other, or they want to um, control the agenda, or maybe they want to drum up business with some outlandish theory uh, that explains the accident. All of these things happen from time to time, and we do try to, you know, have checks and balances to, 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 to try to sort of understand the material that we're, we're dealing with. And secondly, also important to us is credibility. Um, I know that a huge part of the work that goes into an Annex 13 investigation is not just to understand the accident, but to establish the credibility of the investigation so that it will genuinely um, be taken into account and lead to improvements in aviation safety. And that's obviously been a remarkably successful process, but we do, uh, credibility is also important to us because, you know, there's a journalist with no credibility, as I said earlier, we have no other qualifications. So we're used, we're, we're of use to nobody if people, nobody believes us. Um, and I think um, the other sort of thing that perhaps binds us, but also separates us is our red lines. You know, we both have red lines. Um, there are red lines over the protection of information in an Annex 13 investigation. There are, we have red lines about the protection of informants, you know, the people who talk to us. And I take the point that Anne-Marie mentioned that actually that's also mentioned in the Regulation 996 as well, that you, you, you don't issue the lists of people who've can, participated in an investigation. Sometimes those agendas clash, uh, sometimes in what we rightly or wrongly perhaps feel to be the public interest, we may be looking to publish information which you may regard as uh, protected. Um, so what happens when that arises? I mean, there's no hard and fast rule for this. Um, firstly, perhaps the question is, should journalists ever publish 
information that's deemed protected? Well, I, I think um, there are many answers to that, but I, I think where we get into trouble is where we try to make general statements of principle about what journalists should and shouldn't publish. Um, because aviation happens all over the world. There are many, many different jurisdictions involved, different cultures towards press freedom, uh, different um, structures for the management of, of aerospace and aviation. It, it, it quickly becomes very awkward if just as a matter of principle, we say what the press should and shouldn't publish. Um, that's not to say that the press has a carte blanche in, 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 in my opinion to publish anything, I th but it needs to be justified. Um, so how would we try to justify it if that arose? Um, firstly, I think that the test would be you know, does this really advance the story? Is it important? Is it just a piece of information that's published just to attract attention and to make a few headlines? Or is it, is it really contributing to knowledge about what's it going on, about what's going on? Is it really in the public interest? Meaning, does it have, is it realistic that it will have a, a, a real impact on a, a large number of people's lives? I mean, I won't claim that we sit there and have philosophical discussions every time we want to write a story. But I think in the back of our minds, especially as we get more experience and uh, within a sort of an organization where there is an awful lot of internal sort of testing of ourselves like mine, I, I think those, those sorts of discussions are going to be taking place somewhere. Um, and, um, there are, it also depends, I think, what the type of information is. I mean, there, there is information that's set out in the regulations that I can't really imagine except in, I, I mean, I can only think of one example uh, where medical information was an important part of the story. Um, I think uh, there are certain privacy rights that are generally uh, respected, at least by serious news organizations. Should we rule out that people don't, that never publish a, a, a draft report? Uh, well, I would like to think we'd be careful about that, but um, that might depend on the context. And I think one of the, I, I see you pop up there, Max, uh, uh, Matt, so I'm probably running out of time. I'd just like to point out very quickly that it is a little bit of a moving goalpost. Um, there is a sweeping list of items that are protected in, in, the, in the regulations, but they include things like air traffic control uh, conversations, which are in fact freely available in many countries now on the, on the internet. Um, and, uh, and an awful lot of FDR type information is now available on some of the tracking websites like Flight Radar 24, and is already being analyzed on the internet by people who are using it to speculate on the causes. So there is a sort of balancing act there. Um, I, I'll close it there. I hope that's helpful. Um, we have, um, you know, we, we try to validate our information. We try to surround it by context and give readers the tools they need to make up their own minds. We never do it perfectly. And I hope you will challenge us when we don't, but uh, happy to hand it back to you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. That's a really interesting insight. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to keep moving along um, simply because I've failed so abysmally to manage the time. Um, luckily, the person who takes the fall for that is uh, our chair, Olivier Ferrand. Uh, Olivier is a senior advisor on strategy at the BEA, the chair of the ICAO's uh, AIG panel, and obviously most prestigiously, he is uh, chair of ESASI. So he's going to uh, wrap up the discussion for us and provide us an update on the AIG's work. Olivier, over to you. Yes, th th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, you, okay, you hear me well. So, sorry, thank you for your, for your introduction, Matt. I just have a problem. My, uh, my slide is the last one showing up and I'll try to, to move on to the, to the next ones, but, uh, 
uh, I think it's uh, it's kind of uh, of blocked uh, uh, right now. Let me let me try again. But to wrap up the 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 session, uh, I would like to to thank uh, all participants for their uh, for their contributions. We had various uh, perspectives from uh, from different uh, point uh, points of view, um, especially. Uh, we discussed the protection of data, but also the, the release of uh, of the sensitive uh, data, and the fact that um, um, the state investigation authorities is managing sensitive data with a lot of interest outside. It's like being on a on a pressure cooker. Uh, well, I can um, please uh, Hailin uh, send share the the slides because it's. Uh, I'm having a, a problem here. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and to go to, to the initial slide, uh, I wanted to, to, to highlight. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, you can see here uh, the dilemma between protected information and the thirst of public interest that you, uh, that you have. The, the initial slide showed uh, the Air France 447 CVR, which is highly protected. Its content is highly protected, but you could see in, in the background uh, the keen interest of, uh, of journalists uh, uh, really uh, having a, a keen interest in, in its, uh, its content. So if we go on the next slide, uh, this is a little bit what we discussed today. We discussed a various perspective from uh, the media, thank you, Tim, from manufacturers, <clears throat> from regulators, um, from lawyers to, to access uh, that data, which is uh, in the hand of the safety investigation authorities. And safety investigation authorities has uh, the good practice to, to make it public once it's validated. So if we move on to, to the next slide, because we're running short of time, and I'm, and I'm sorry about, uh, about that. Uh, we got various answers to the various points that were highlighted by our, by our, our, our speakers. And Mary uh, gave us a very good update on, uh, on uh, Annex 13, uh, re regulation, um, uh, regulation uh, 996, as well as Dutch, um, Dutch national law. Um, the, 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 the document that you see on the screen, th this manual, uh, contains a good deal of uh, of information that you that you have um, in uh, uh, that you have there. It's a very good very good guidance, and eighty percent of the of the questions that uh, are asked about the protection of data you can find answer there. You have then the national laws, and you have the balancing test, uh, and we we heard uh, a number of examples with jurisprudence uh, given by. Uh, by uh, by Rob Lawson, uh, which uh, are of strong uh, of strong interest, and finally, with regard to the relation with the judicial uh, authorities, uh, we have uh, uh, advanced arrangements at uh, at national levels where uh, the the different points can be can be addressed. Um, this is a the, the slideshow mode. Uh, I'm sorry about that. But th the slide that you see uh, right now, I prepared those uh, th those slides uh, as uh, as you presented. But uh, this uh, the slides that you see uh, right now are recent events, uh, recent ICAO events uh, where those points were were addressed. And uh, this one is about uh, the high level safety conference that took place. Uh, last uh, last October, there was, there was a paper presented by Colombia on uh, on uh, the communization of, of accidents, and these are are points uh, that uh, will be dealt with by by the panel and uh, and by the states. And as you can see, uh, it's um, to to make a distinction between uh, the issues of liability and the issue of accident uh, investigation. As well as for for ICAO to to develop guidance on avoiding criminalization of uh, of accidents and incident investigation and to build the relationship of those involved in aviation activities like what we are trying to do um, today. And last week there was um, uh, a symposium on family assistance and one of the outcomes uh, we, we we got 
was to um, uh, really to to work on uh, addressing the need for timely public release of uh, of factual information and of course sharing uh, sharing uh, uh, more information at uh, at regional level. So I tried to capture a little bit uh, the uh, what was discussed today. I'm sorry about this slideshow mode as as we uh, uh, as a as it, this was uh, was done as as, as we spoke. Uh, the last slide, of course, is to to see each other soon in uh, in Budapest. We are trying to have those events uh, every every six months, but ideally, uh, we will try really to to see each other in person and and to to continue the, this this. Um, this discussion, because uh, the challenges around uh, the protection of uh, sensitive safety in, in information are are present and will be addressed via the forums I I mentioned. But there is a lot to uh, to discuss. Uh, I'm sorry about this slideshow mode, but I just wanted to to capture to capture that quickly again to thank our our speakers. Thank you, Tim, Al Alessandro, Bern. Uh, Michelle and and, uh, and Anne Marie, and I hand over again to 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 Matt for a last round of of question and and discussion. We still have five minutes. Thanks, Olivier. I've learned the lesson there that um, when somebody asks you for a slide template, you might want to mention that it's got an automatic advance on it and it loops back to the beginning, which is, I should tell you now, that slideshow I sent you has a loop in it and an automatic advance. Rather than overrunning, uh, I think let's uh, let's call it a day there. I'd like to thank you to all of our speakers. That's it's been really, really helpful, really, really enlightening, and a fascinating subject area that I think we're going to keep coming back to. Um, thank you to all the Assassi committee members for their work in organising, and Alistair and Eileen at the AIB. Thank you to the Icelandic Agency for letting us use their Zoom account, and thank you to all of you for for joining and engaging. It's it's really great to see so many of you. Uh, engaged and involved um, and hopefully we'll be able to meet uh, in Budapest. I know some of us uh, are feeling it hard, the, the lack of face-to-face, -face, so hopefully Budapest will be able to go ahead and we'll be able to meet there. Uh, we'll try and produce a summary of what we've talked about here today, um, but for now thank you very much and hope to see you all again soon. <laughs>